tonight's message, um, is called the uh, Ambassador of Christ, the Anointed One. And so, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the gift of worship. Thank you for receiving our worship. Thank you for coming in the midst of our worship. Thank you that we could worship with heaven. We just, work, we just are so grateful, and I just pray that... Um, you would help me to bring forth what you put on my heart, Lord God, and it wouldn't just be words, but it would go into our hearts and uh, transform our lives by your Holy Spirit's power. Amen. So, um, I just, I have a lot to share, so help the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read um, from um, Mark 6. And it says this, I'm going to read it out of the message. Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeal for funds. Keep it simple. No luxury inns. Get a modest place and be content there till you leave. If you're not welcome, do not listen to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then when they were on the road, they preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they set the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies, and healing their spirits. I loved reading it out of that um, translation. I loved when it says, you are the equipment. Mm -hmm. Each one of us is the equipment. And they preached with joyful urgency. Life can be radically different. What an amazing promise and what an amazing message that we have. So Jesus gave them, as he has given to each one of us, everything we need. And we know that once we're his, we have the Holy Spirit Christ in us. Now Nehemiah 8:10 says this, that Ezra told them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the, and the sweet drink, send portions to him for whom nothing is prepared for this day is only to our Lord. And be not grieved and depressed for the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. And that is so important in this hour. We have to have joy. In a nation that's spinning out of control, we need to walk in that place of confidence in our Lord with joy. He's our stronghold, and that is the place that our energy comes from. That is where everything that we need comes from. Now, I'm going to be you know, sharing uh, different passages as we're going along. And... Um, <clears throat> I just want to look at 2 Corinthians 5, where 2 Corinthians 5 says, we're to be cheerfully pleasing God, and that is to be our main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God. That's our main thing. You know, people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. It's really simple. <laughs> cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing. In Philippians 4.4, 4, in the Passion Translation, it says, Be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life and let joy overflow. Why? Because you are united with the Anointed One. See, it doesn't make any difference what else is going on in our life. He will, he will help us with all of us. He will direct us. The main thing that keeps our joy is that we have the privilege, oh my gosh, that we are united with the Anointed One. So, as I said, this mission is being an ambassador for Christ, the Anointed One. So what is, uh, um, what is an ambassador? An ambassador, according to the Prophet's Dictionary, is a person engaged as a foreign representative to conduct diplomatic business on behalf of a country. So we literally are foreign representatives, in truth, because the Word of God says this is not a home. Mm -hmm. We are from a different place. We are from heaven. We are, we, we're birthed out of the Father. 
This is not our home. Heaven is our home. We actually are aliens, if you will, and we really are. We consider ourselves foreigners, and we bring a message of another country. What country? Heaven is our home. God's kingdom forever and ever and ever. And that um, we're also to be ambassadors of peace. Now, you know, there are, there, are, there are times for war and seasons for war, but we are to be the ambassadors of his peace, the message of peace to every man's heart, whether it be in a season of war or a season of peace. He is the Prince of Peace, and peace is what is to rule our lives. So we are ambassadors of his realm, the realm of I am. And this requires to be an ambassador that we know his heart. Like really know his heart and we know what his standards are, what his plumb line is. His kingdom in heaven we are called to bring down and release on earth. That means we should be able to speak the truth with clarity about our king and about his kingdom. Very clear and very simple. And um, it's not just what we want to speak. You know, we can say we just want to speak mercy, but if we don't speak about his judgment, then we are not bringing the full measure of God. If we don't even want to speak heaven and say there isn't hell, we haven't brought the full truth. We must preach both. We can't just speak about forgiveness. We have to address that there's forgiveness for what? Sin. And so sin must be talked about. There's mercy and there's grace. Um, so it's carrying the full revelation and not partial. And we have to check ourselves to see what, when we're talking with people, are we erring on one side or the other? Mm. Oh, there it is. It's all, it's all set, you know what I'm saying. There, there isn't help. No, there is help. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And there's many, many multitudes that do not believe in that, but that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. Messengers, which be messengers of truth and messengers of light and messengers of hope and messengers of peace and ministers of reconciliation and ministers of restoration. You know about that should be with well, that schooling out there in Washington. Second Corinthians 5. Um, I just love it from the message. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some of that, okay, because it's just so powerful from the message. Um, it talks about cheerfully pleasing God, as I said before, is the main thing. And that's what we aim to do, regardless of our conditions. Because sooner or later, we're all going to have to face God. We will before, appear before Christ and to take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, good or bad. Then he goes on to talk about, I'm skipping down. Our first decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death, so everyone could also be included in his life of resurrection. Um, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by how they look. We looked at the, that Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. It's created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God, who settled the relationship between us and him, and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And God has given us, what? The task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God because he's already a friend in you. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ's representatives. You see, it's very clear what we're supposed to be doing. It's, it's pretty clear that we don't have to be um, a rock and scientist to figure it out. Ephesians 6 20, 
in the Amplified Version, says this, I am an ambassador in a, in, in a coupling chain in prison and pray that I may declare boldly and courageously as I ought to do. Yes, he says in the Passion Translation, pray that I may preach the wonderful news of God's kingdom with bold freedom at every opportunity, even though I'm chained as a prisoner, I am his ambassador. You see, it doesn't make any difference where you are, in prison, in prison, on your job, in your home, on your street, in another nation, it does not make any difference. This is our main purpose here. We ought to be his ambassadors, his voice. If we are silent, they won't hear. So he's asking for prayer. He's a prisoner, but he's an ambassador. He's a prisoner by earth's rules, but in the spirit, he's completely free. Nobody can chain our spirits. Absolutely nobody. We are free as long as we're free in him. And so um, he goes on to say, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he reminds us that we are ambassadors of the anointed one. We are Christ's ambassadors. And he says, God is making his appeal through us as Christ's personal representatives. It's not an angel. And angels do bring messages. They do. It's in the Bible. We read it today. I hear of it today. But the truth of it is, is that he is calling us his personal representatives. And he's begging, um, he's saying, I'm begging to let you to lay hold of the divine favor now offered and be reconciled to God. And this is what he's releasing out when he walked the earth, and this is what we're to be like, re release when we um, walk the earth. So, Proverbs 13, 17 says this, an undependable messenger causes a lot of trouble. But the trustworthy and wise messengers release healing everywhere they go. You see, we're people that bring reconciliation. We're people that bring restoration. We don't stir up strife. We don't stir up trouble. We release healing everywhere we go. The Amplified Version says, A wicked messenger falls into evil, but a faithful ambassador brings healing. Faithful ambassadors, that's what we're called to be bring healing. Faithful, trustworthy, wise. They are this way because they know the king and his ways and his desires. Um, we speak as he speaks. And the other thing is not just speaking when he speaks, but our countenance is really important. If we are looking doomed and gloomed and depressed and oppressed, nobody's going to believe our message. Our message is only as true as what we're living and what we're experiencing with the king. And so it's our carrying his countenance and having his attributes come forth through our lives. He trusts us. And uh, we have no agenda except being his messengers. We're dependable. Wherever he sends us to go, and we've said yes, our yes is our yes. We don't jump out midstream. We don't say, okay, we heard you here today, Jesus, but now this week we don't know that you really said that, so we're, I, we're, we think we're going to change our mind. That's not, a, that's not possible for an ambassador. That's possible for a follower of, of the Lord. Immature, but it's not possible for a mature ambassador and messenger of God. No matter the cost, no matter the place, no matter the outcome, when we have said we will do it, we will do it. And what we will bring is the kingdom of light wherever we go into the kingdom of darkness. Um, it's, this isn't casual Christianity. This is discipleship. And it's our line hearts are completely aligned in allegiance with us. He can trust that if wherever he puts us, wherever that is, even in the darkest place, that our hearts will not be swayed or ears will not be enticed by words that could seek to, you know, tickle our ears and seduce our hearts, that he can trust that the kingdom that we are representing, we will not be moved. You know, when I used to work in marketing, 
um, for a company years ago. We would, when we were hire people that would come and represent this company, they would be representatives. It was a lot of steps. You weren't just hired. First, there was a resume presented. <coughs> then there was a review of that. Then there was a phone call, maybe one or two phone calls. And then there was a meeting. And then, because um, the, the office, actually the main office at one point was right out of my home, they came and stayed in my home. Why was that? Because you don't really know somebody until you have time with them. When you wake up with them, when you go to bed, you follow what I'm saying, and you've lived several days together. Things that could maybe be hidden at a lunch at Panera Bread, do you follow what I'm saying, is not going to be hidden when they're in your home. Eventually, things are going to come out. And it was trying to determine, are they trustworthy? Do they have the same goals? Are they team players? Are they humble? Will they represent the com company right? Only then were they hired and then still kept in close contact with. So he has given us the ambassadorship of his kingdom. And he's saying, okay, can I trust you to carry the heart of my kingdom and represent my nature? Um, that you go out wherever I send you, not to take over, but to serve. That every gift I've given you is to serve. And that that has de been developed over this trust relationship as you've walked with the Lord. And he sends you out because he trusts you. There's false and true messengers. Then, in Jesus' day, Paul talked about it, Jesus talked about it, and there's false and true messengers today. Um, we could go into great depth about it, but I'm going to just touch a little bit about Hezekiah for a few minutes. Hezekiah was the king of Judah. And he had received um, letters, messengers came, ambassadors came with letters from uh, king Assyria, the king of Assyria, um, Sennacherib, or however you pronounce his name. And this letter had threats and challenging Israel's God. If you really read the whole, this whole letter, it's like, wow. Oh my gosh, you can't even believe that this king would be speaking to the eternal God this way. Of course, he didn't believe he was. Hezekiah called upon God, and he called upon the prophet Isaiah, and then the king took the letter, and he put it before God, and he prayed. And God heard the prayers, and he completely delivered them from this king, and from his evil um, attack, plans of attack. Completely destroy them with, the, with the angels. He sent angels to, to completely destroy them. And then he sent great blessings and great wealth to King Hezekiah. He, because he had it is because the king had in his heart the protection and the concern of the people in God's plans. But what happened was pride came. King Hezekiah got sick. And what happens is, when he's sick, now a king sends princes from Babylon, come with letters, ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, come with letters to present to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, so full of pride and all of the riches, he says, let me show you my gold, let me show you my silver, let me show you my spices, let me show you my ointments. Let me show you my treasury. Let me show you everything. And the father spoke to Isaiah, and he said, what evil has this king done? So Isaiah goes to him and says to him, because of this, all will be carried off, and some of your sons will be taken away, and some of your sons will be eunuchs before the king princes of Babylon. And here King Hezekiah, who at one time put the letters before the Lord and prayed for his people, hear him at this point. And Hezekiah said it was good it was happening in the future and not in his day. God left him to himself to try him that God might know all that was in his heart. And this is what he says. He says, Peace and faithfulness in my days. Oh my gosh. 
is that not being said by some of the root leaders in this nation today? Our president is before I'm saying petition, but there are others. We're not going to get into politics tonight. The peace and faithfulness in my days. What was in his heart was his own comfort. One who had once fasted and prayed and sought the face of God, and God's response was an angelic army who destroyed his enemy. And now he is no longer trustworthy, and he can no longer represent God to his people or to any place else. He ends up, he does die. So, we can be used to God and bring his deliverance to, his person, to a person, to a place, to a region, but only must be careful of the motivations of our heart. What, see, God looks at the heart. That's what he's looking at. He's not looking at our gifts and talents. Every gifts and talent we have came from him. He already knows them, and he's not impressed one way or another. He's the one that gave them to us. He's not stunned. Oh, look, Jen can dance. He already knew you would dance. Oh, look, Chicky can play the keyboard, and Wayne can play the drums, and David can paint, and on and on I could go. He is not like, oh, wow, can you believe that, Jesus? What they're looking at is, what is the heart they're doing this with? You know, because I'll tell you what, there's two tests you have to face all the time. Two tests that you have to pass. Rejection and when people speak well. Rejection and when people speak well of you. Those are the two tests all the time, the tests of our heart. And so um, the impact of that negatively, you know, can affect people all ar around, you know, everybody that we have influence with. Listen back to Philemon with a letter, believing that because of Philemon's mature Christian walk, that he would be able to come into a place, walk in forgiveness, and accept him back. So in Philemon 12, verse 12, Paul writes that he is sending his own heart with him and wanting to keep him with him and helping him in prison, not as a slave, but as a fellow believer. So, here he is. He's an ambassador of reconciliation and an ambassador of restoration declaring forgiveness over, over Onesimus. He's saying Onesimus is new in Christ, and he's no longer a slave to Philemon, and he's no longer a slave to sin. He said Onesimus has been forgiven. You know, Christ, we know, forgave Paul of everything that he did. All of the evil before he was a Christian, then Paul walks his life and lives his life the same way. He forgives his persecutors. He forgives his jailers. He forgives the, the, you know, the government that he was under. He forgives, he, he, he models and exudes a life and a message of the cross and forgiveness. Remember when Paul and Silas were in jail, they weren't sitting there moaning, complaining, murmuring, where are you, God? They were worshiping God with everything that they had. And we know that God's response was an earthquake came, the doors flew open, the jailer gets saved, the whole place gets saved. Why? Because they did not walk. Every place that they went, even when they were imprisoned, they were ambassadors and messengers of God. He would even, we will see, as I unfold this, pay Onesimus' debt just as Jesus paid Paul debt in full for Paul's sins and our sins. Now he would be an ambassador of another realm and another kingdom. You know, we're all free. When we know Jesus, all of our debts are paid. We know this. So in Philemon 1.9 in the Amplified Version, it says, For love's sake, Philemon, I appeal to you just for what I am. Paul, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, an old man and now a prisoner for his sake also. In the Passion Translation, it says this, I'd much rather make an appeal because of our friendship. So here I am, an old man, a prisoner for Christ, making my loving appeal to you. It's on, my, on behalf of my child, 
whose spiritual father I became while here in prison. Oh, by the way, that's an Esimus. You see, he didn't begin telling him it was an Esimus. He's just talking about this one who he fathered, helped bring into the kingdom. And now he says, oh, and by his name, by the way, his name is Onesimus. Paul, an ambassador of Christ Jesus, a prisoner for his sake, a prisoner of the anointed one, this anointed king, he's writing, it's so important to understand, he's making this loving appeal to Philemon. Whom I have begotten in the faith while captive in these chains. That's a powerful statement. Who have begotten. I mean, he brought him forth almost like a woman bringing forth a child in labor pains. You know what I'm saying? There was great um, uh, amount of, you know, depth into this. Um, so we know, as I already said, Onesimus was a slave to Philemon. Now, Philemon was a wealthy believer. A wealthy believer. He was married. And he had great influence in the city of Colossus where he lived. And he had great impact and he had community meetings and gatherings in his home. Um, but when Onesimus escaped and ran away, a runaway slave, he stole from him. And Onesimus fled to Rome. Why Rome? Because you could get lost there. Eight, nine thousand people. If I'm not, you just get lost. Not a little village. Rome was the big place. But somehow, it does not say in any of the records how he ended up in prison with Paul. But there he was. That's divine providence. That's how. He became a believer and followed Christ. And as we said, I said, Paul's spiritual son, who then he personally discipled. And then Onesimus became one who served him. Onesimus served Paul, not as a slave, as he had served Philemon but as a son, and that is very different. A son who loved a father, that's two different things. Slavery and serving a son to a father. Paul is writing, however, to his other spiritual son, Philemon, about his spiritual son. So he's a father. Now, because of this, that makes them spiritual blood brothers. And by the blood of the Lamb, they are spiritual brothers. So they're brothers by the blood, and they're brothers because they've been fathered in the spirit by the same father. So, Onesimus' name means useful. It means beneficial. And so he writes, Paul writes to Philemon, and he says, prior, formerly, he was not useful or valuable to you. But now, he's valuable to me, and he's valuable to you. And he says, I'm not writing to you using my apostolic authority, which I could. He could just say, here it is. He was the apostle over the churches. Here it is. This is what I'm actually saying to do. You, you need to welcome him. You need to do this. But he's not writing like that, as he does in other letters or when he's visiting other churches and he's used his apostolic authority because he's needed to. But he's using this loving, gentle approach because he's coming from this role as a spiritual father to Philemon. And so he's allowing his heart to be led by the Spirit as he's penning this letter. And how to address this situation and how the Father in Heaven wants to bring restoration. You see, that's what ambassadors, that's what we do. We don't have this, well, let me see. It's formula number 45. We pull that out of our little folder, and this is what we use when we go to work. And number 103 is what we use when we go to Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know, I'm just making this stuff up. But you see, it's not a formula. It's as ambassadors, we're listening intently for each one. What do I say? What do I do? What do you want to do in this situation? And he, and he appeals on the basis of love, period. His whole appeal is on the basis of love, which is what true ambassadorship of the kingdom of God looks like. Always has, always will. Paul goes and says something that 
This just blew my mind. I had to read this over and over and over again this week. I just kept reading it. He says, he is my very heart. He is, Anathemus is my very heart, the depth of that. I'm sending him back to you in his own person, but it's like sending my own heart. That's amazing. The depth of their relationship. That's like a mother with a baby. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like if you were to have your baby and send the baby someplace else, like you'd be sending your heart. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This is the type of relationship. They, there was such a closeness, knit by the Spirit of God. This is astounding. It's like I'm sending my own heart. And it would pain Paul's heart to return Onesimus to Philemon. But he writes in this letter and he sends it with Onesimus in Tychicus. He sent them together. He didn't send him alone. When he sent them, the book, the, the book of Colossians, that letter was also written at the very same time. So they carried both letters when they went to Philemon. Both letters, Philemon and the book of Colossians, were brought by Onesimus and Tychicus. Paul didn't want to keep Onesimus, however, without his permission. Even though he could have. But he was like everything, every bit of the relationship, he wanted right. He wanted it done right in the eyes of heaven and in his own heart. And so he, how did he even know about any of this? Because Onesimus told him. He would not know where Onesimus came from, that he was a runaway slave. But you see, that's what true fathering, you know, when you're safe, people just unfold things. There's nothing to be hidden because he was safe. So he wanted Philemon to respond with forgiving love. And that's what the kingdom of God is. It's forgiving love. So Paul asked Philemon to forgive him and love him as a brother. Even though he said, I wish I could keep him as a helper here in my in prison to take your place. He you follows in because that's who was helping him. And he addresses possibly, he says, possibly Onesimus. He was separated from Philemon for a while, so when he returns, he's no longer a slave, but he's a dear brother. A dear brother. And then he goes on to say, and especially dear to me. What does he keep talking about? The depth of relationship and emotion that these two have. He says, you know, would you, you know, dear, dear to Paul and would be to Philemon as a fellow believer, no longer a slave. Like when I send him back, I'm not sending him back to you as a slave and you can't receive him as a slave. When he comes back to you, I'm asking you to receive him as a fellow believer and as a dearly loved. Welcome him, he goes on to say, as you would welcome me. Accept him as you would accept me. As a Christian brother, because that almost slave relationship thing can't exist anymore, but be reconciled and come together as spiritual sons and brothers. And then he goes on to say, and if he's stolen anything, and owes anything, place it on my account. Charge it to my account, he writes. He said, forgiveness and reconciliation, whatever it takes, whatever it takes on my part, I'm so asking you to release forgiveness and to be reconciled to him. Paul didn't know anything else. He was, truly, his identity was he was an ambassador of the anointed one, Christ Jesus. Paul never went around and called himself with a title. He said, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. It's a very different term. Meaning he was God's servant. He didn't have to have anybody call him anything. He knew exactly who he was. 
God told him who he was. He says, I'm willing to pay back his debt. Just as Jesus paid ours when he hung on the cross. You know, there's going to be situations he's going to put us in. That we're going to have to forgive when we don't feel like it. We're going to be asked to forgive. We don't have to do anything. We're going to be asked to forgive. We may be in a situation right now that he's asking you to forgive. And maybe even cover that debt. Let that revenge go. Let I want to be understood. <coughs> I want to be paid back. I want everybody to know my story and my side of the story. Guess what? It doesn't matter because heaven knows every single detail. And that's all that matters. We lay the letters of accusation and whatever else has come your way at his feet. And leave them. That is our freedom and our liberty that he gives us when we forgive. So anyways, um, he, he says, I write it in my own handwriting saying I am good for this. He wasn't having anybody scribe this like in other places. He wrote it, this letter, in his own handwriting. As a father would to a son, saying, I'm good for this. I will pay back fully as a spiritual father, I will be responsible for his debt. And what he's doing again is he's demonstrating the depth of his commitment to see this relationship restored. How far will we go to see relationships restored? You know what I'm saying? Not in our own clever thinking, but what the father asks of us. And so, um, he gently reminds Philemon, however, you owe me your very self. Because why? It says because he brought him the message of life. He was the one that led Philemon to the Lord. And so, then he became a spiritual father. So again, he appeals with tender love and the forgiveness as a father and an ambassador of Christ. Paul love for Onesimus was because they truly were family. And Onesimus, it says, ministered, use the word specifically, ministered to Paul's needs, and he was his helper. Um, now, that's a very different. When he wrote in this, in this, in uh, verse 16, he says to Onesimus, he says to Philemon, Onesimus is no longer a slave. And that word slave right there is um, doulas. And that means exactly slave. Slave. But when he says he's my helper, he's helping me, he's ministering to me, he uses a word there that's called diakono. And that means dearly beloved brother family. So he's using very specific words in his handwriting that in those days they understood. He is a slave and he is a family member. Two very different things. And so in Colossians, um, I'm going to skip that and go down to here. There's a pastor in Kansas, Jack Drummond, that wrote this. God desires forgiveness and that he is in the business of restoring life. God sees no difference between his children. God has placed the cross for all to come, all to come to for forgiveness. And the cross is the level to, levels the ground where the rich and the poor, the free and the slave, the male and the female are seen as equal before God. It says in Galatians 3:28, "This is the very reason I've been made a minister by the authority of God and a servant to His body." It's his detailed plan that I would fully equip you with the word of God. And it's all about forgiveness <coughs> and releasing for the plan of forgiveness and the promise of forgiveness. So Paul asked Philemon to cheer and refresh his heart in Christ, to enrich his soul. 
He's stating his confidence that he would comply with his request and perhaps do even more than what Paul asked. Again, this is a father that's appealing to his son. Now, let's go to Acts 9 for a moment here. In Acts 9, remember Ananias, who had an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord came to Ananias and said, Ananias, I want you to go to a street called Abundance in Damascus, and that's where he lived, and look for a man named from Tarsus named Saul. Now, Ananias was concerned, and he said to the Lord, like, are you kidding me? Basically, you know, this is the guy that's um, known for terrible persecution in Jerusalem, and we all know that he's on his way here to Damascus, like we're expecting him any day now, and to come and seize and imprison us like he did in Jerusalem. But the Lord says to Ananias, arise and go. I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. I have chosen this man to be my ambassador. Pretty clear, pretty specific. So he goes and lays hands on him. And what does he say to him? Saul, my brother, the Lord Jesus, and on and on and on and on and on. We know the scales fell from Paul's eyes, and now he could see. And Ananias was acting as an ambassador of the king's heart, being used as a restorer, being used to speak the word of the Lord into Paul and into Saul, who becomes Paul. And Saul. Life is forever changed. Saul goes out and he starts preaching. So now let's go forward a little bit in the book, in the book of Acts, Acts 9, further down. And it says, now um, in Jerusalem, Paul, Saul's in Jerusalem, and Barnabas came to Saul's defense. And when Saul tried to introduce himself to fellow believers, they doubted he was a true disciple. Why? Because they knew that if he was not, and he was a plant, that every one of their lives was at risk. How could it be? This terrorist, this terrorist who was coming, who was in over there, and, and then over there, and then Damascus. This guy? There's no way. But Barnabas brought him before the apostles. Paul saw shared his supernatural experience at the Damascus Road, and then Barnabas got up and told everybody there, how Saul boldly preached throughout the city in Jesus' mighty name. Then, it says, then, boom, then they accepted him as a brother, and he remained with them. That means they, they welcomed him into the family. They didn't people, they accepted him. He remained with them. He joined them everywhere they went in Jerusalem. He boldly preached in power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. That's Paul's beginning. And he's never forgotten his beginning, his encounter with the Lord, his time with Ananias who was sent to him, his call to be a messenger and ambassador, Ananias who called him brother, Barnabas who called him brother, who stood before the apostles as a, um, a man that stood and said, no, he's the real deal, you can trust him. Who caused Paul to be Saul to be embraced and accepted as family because of them. And now he is standing there doing the same thing. Can you see what was done to him? He continues to walk in. This was what he was mentored and discipled in, and this is what he is reproducing. So because of Ananias' obedience and others, because of Paul's and Philemon's obedience and the church of Colossus' response to Paul's letter, Philemon's journey in history, let's hear the rest of what is not talked about, about Onesimus. Early Christian leader Ignatius Bishop of Antioch wrote a letter to Ephesus. He addressed the pastor of the church of Ephesus multiple times in his letter. This one he 
this, this one he called Onesimus. Onesimus would have been in his 70s at the time of these letters, and he would have been an elder and a pastor in the spirit of the church. Though he was a one away slave, he was forgiven, he was embraced. He became part of the church, part of the family. And um, even more so, F.F. F. Bruce, a New Testament scholar, writes this, Onesimus was instrumental in collecting and preserving the letters written by Paul. That's a significant responsibility. Church scholars tell us there's good evidence that he, Onesimus, gathered the letters of Paul into one place. The servant to Paul until Paul's death, a servant to Christ until his death. History tells us he was martyred. Onesimus, during the reign of Emperor Trajan, and the reason they killed him was because he refused to deny Christ. He was taken to a prison to, in Rome. He testified before Judge Tertullus, and he was condemned to death by stoning. And that was not enough. Then they took his corpse beheaded him in A.D. 109. Onesimus, a runaway slave, who ended up in prison with Paul, who Paul led to Jesus, fathered him, discipled him, returned him to Philemon as a father, petitioned him with tender love, asked that forgiving love would be released, that the former identity of being a slave would be put behind and that he would become a fellow brother. Mm. And because of Philemon's response and the church that he oversaw and his influence in Colossus, they welcomed and embraced him, so much so, discipled and fathered him, that he became a pastor and eventually the bishop replacing Timothy when Timothy died in the church of Ephesus. We never know what our gift is an ambassador to Jesus Christ, whose life we're going to touch. We never know who they're going to be, who they're going to touch, because they're going to touch lives that you may never have the opportunity to. It's so, I just love this, this so blew my mind. I'm just going to read a couple more things and then I want to close with what the Lord has here. I want to read, this is by Brian Simmons. It's based on Mark 12, 31. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us are afraid to live in the exposed, vulnerable state of heart that love demands. As Christians, we talk about love much more often than we live it. But real love is daring. It's exciting. It boldly conquers evil and then heals and reunites with God to those, those whom it loves. It's aggressive. The state of love of which we are afraid is that transitory stage where we are learning to forgive. This is the aspect of love that hurts. And its hurt is amplified by our reluctance to forgive. We, like Jesus, must live in a continual attitude of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Then we can step into the joy and the power of aggressive love. God's love is not just forgiving, it's for living. As we overcome bitterness and climb out of the pit of unforgiveness, suddenly we're as bold as a lion and love grows from being a commandment to becoming an adventure. Isn't that powerful? Love grows from being a commandment to being an adventure. I want to end this part we're going to move into communion and I'm going to put on a song with what I, I feel the Lord has the invitation he's given. I'm, I'm sure most of you know um, but Rick Joyner, you know, is 
um, with the Lord, the, the encounter he had with the Lord about the Second American Revolution, the Civil War. And he wrote this, Justice and liberty is for all. From heaven's perspective, we did not win the Revolutionary War. That war was more about um, was more about more than just gaining our independence. It was about liberty and a revolution in the government of men that would establish and maintain liberty and justice for all. Some significant things were accomplished in this war, but there were also some very basic ways that it fell short of what heaven viewed as successful. If the founders had truly believed that all men were created evil, equal, what they declared to be the reason for seeking independence, that slavery would not have been possible, and the Civil War would not have been inevitable. If the Civil War had been successful according to Heaven's perspective, then there would not have been a need for such things as the Civil Rights Movement, or many of the conflicts we are still fighting. The Union may have prevailed in crushing the rebellion and ending slavery, which was essential, but it did not prevail in a way that established justice and liberty for all. Mm -hmm. Heaven's perspective on history and current events can be very different from, our, from ours. Our basic devotion must be to see with the Lord's eyes, to hear with his ears, to understand with his heart. This was what the Holy Spirit was given for, and this is how we are led into all truth. We can be right in our politics, our policies, our beliefs, but have pride that is more deadly than the evil we are fighting. Pride caused the first fall and virtually every fall since. We can be right, but not be righteous. For winning the present war it is crucial to not just fight for what is right, but to do it in the right spirit. We must fight for right and we and we must do it right. So, <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5, 7 through 21. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, that's the passages I'm referring to. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God we're tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. This is such a powerful passage. This, people, is our commission. This is our mandate. This is why when we were saved, he didn't take us home. And he left us here. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So I would ask this to you. Who are our anesthetists? Who are our Philemon's? Where are our Ananias's? Where are our Bibles? Where are our thoughts? As I prepared this message, so I said, okay, so that's all. Here's the message, and what is it that you want? What is it you're asking? Why did you have me bring all of this forth? And really, what it is, is it's an invitation to respond if you want. He's tenderly pleading and asking and extending his heart today and saying, would you recommit again today? Would we not struggle with whether we have a title or we're known? It's before your name, after your name, and I know that's not even true of anybody in this room, but whoever's listening, Whether you do great things, in men's eyes, small things, what matters 
is what I would say. To be his ambassadors of his heart. To be the representatives of the kingdom that we came from. His kingdom realm. And to do it with tender love. Appealing through our lives, through our lips, and with our lives. Because this is our mandate, people. And this is our call. And this is our purpose. On earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. That's our decree. And that's our dream. That every person's life would come into agreement with the blood of Jesus Christ that he poured out for every man, woman, and child. Even the vilest of our enemies, even the most wicked terrorist in this earth, he hung on the cross. Paul was a terrorist in his day. A terrorist. A terrorist. title he had, Ambassador Christ. So what I'm going to do is, you have a song the Lord has me play, so there's a few of them. I'm going to take out communion here. And what had me have a um, magnet created. Created a Design, whatever. You know. Yeah. I can't draw, but I can. It's what? What do you say? And what the magnet says. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world. So that every single day you can put this someplace and the enemy can't tell you you don't know who you are and what you're doing and what your purpose is. This is what you hold in the face of every lie, every place that you think you have a value or you haven't measured up or what the heck, why am I on this earth? What's it all about? This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. It's so simple, and yet it will cost us everything. So, if you like, there you go. There's communion. So, Father, Jesus, we thank you for the power of your blood. We thank you that you said, eat this in memory of me. Drink this in memory of me. Jesus, we thank you for your amazing sacrifice that you poured up every drop of your blood. We know that there is amazing power in remembering you and taking communion. Lord, I believe even tonight you want to heal bodies. I believe tonight you want to heal memories and hearts and wounds and release an amazing fountain of forgiveness that would overflow, wash away um, residue of any place, Father, where we've been hurt, any place of guilt, any place, Father, that we haven't been able to forgive. I call upon your supernatural forgiveness to pour into every heart in this room, including mine, every person watching live, every person that will watch, Lord, as it goes over, um, 1623 Studios. Father, I pray that there would be amazing power, your resurrection power, the power of your blood that will go out, that washes sin, that brings men, women, and children to the salvation of you, that you are the Savior of the world, that you hung on a cross, that every man, woman, and child could know their Father, know that he came out, that each one came out of the Father's heart and could be restored to that relationship because of your because of hanging on the cross and raising from rising from the dead, and you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that we've been forgiven. We thank you that you've called us to be your ambassadors, messages of reconciliation, that you would use us to restore men, women, and children to you because it's all about family. You 
are a family, God, that asks one thing, that we believe in your Son, and that we would follow him and love him with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our soul and all of our being. So, Father, I pray that there be a fresh commitment today to be your messengers and ambassadors, the highest calling that we can have. Higher than representing any government or company on this earth to represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, oh my God. So I open the communion table and I'm going to put on a song.